Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Well, good morning, Calvary. Thanks for tuning in for your word for the day today. It's great to have you joining us here on this lovely Tuesday. Uh, or maybe you're watching on a different day. I don't actually know. But uh, today is Tuesday that this word for the day is for. And we're going through the book of Matthew. And we get to uh, a, a passage today that, that might strike you as a little peculiar. Um, and so as before we read this, I want to reference back. Uh, the, the Pharisees had just recently, earlier in this chapter, made an accusation against Jesus and said that he was actually the son of Beelzebub, son of a demon, basically, and that his power to cast out demons was just because he himself was a demon. He's kicking out his buddies. Uh, and so Jesus addressed that, and he talked about that. And, and, but the, that topic of demon possession and, and the, the forces of evil has come back up as Jesus is teaching through. So in Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to read a few verses for us here today. Starting in verse 43, he says this. It says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds a house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it also will be with this evil generation. Now, there's a lot of places that we can go with this. Some people want to camp out simply in demon possession and exorcism. Uh, many scholars think that Jesus is actually making a, a statement against the spiritual condition of the land and the, the spiritual condition of the, the nation of Israel in that time. Um, but I want to draw maybe a, a connection that, that is more personal to us today. Less of, hey, let's use this as some binoculars into someone else's spiritual life and more as a magnifying glass into our own, uh, or a mirror rather, into our own life. And there's a couple of correlations that I think this passage takes us to uh, that, that aren't simply about demon possession, uh, because it, more than likely that doesn't apply to those of us watching today. But leaning into what is the power of evil like? What is um, sin like and what does it do in our life? And, and I think there's a couple connections. And the first is that it's important to fill our life with Jesus when we remove sin from it. And, and, and I, I thought about this as I was getting ready. I was thinking about the, the season, about a decade or so of working with teenagers. And, and oftentimes we'd be a, a youth retreat or a youth camp, summer camp type event. And somewhere in the midst of that, there'd be a student who was like, hey, I'm in. I'm following Jesus. I'm confessing all this sin. And they'd pour everything out. And it'd be so wonderful and so encouraging. And then a week after we get home, they are back into their old way of sin and rebellion and self-destructive living, usually more so. And for a while, I was like, what, what's going on here? Why is it that they're just going back? And it's because they repented of sin and turned from it, but didn't actually change their life to focus on Jesus and fill it with him. And maybe you've been in a similar place. Maybe you said, hey, I'm going to repent of this. I'm going to leave this area of sin behind and you remove something, but you didn't fill that void in your life with pursuing Jesus and growing closer to him and spending time with him daily, and maybe you reverted back. I think that's a risk for us. We need to be filling our life with Jesus and letting him indwell those places and, and removing sin, replacing it with Jesus. And it also shows, though, the power of unrestrained sin in our life. And, and, and maybe also the, the power of unrestrained evil. Um, but for us personally, we look at our life and if we think we can just manage sin and manage those areas of evil that are within each of us as fallen, broken people, we, we have to understand that it may be growing. See, the, this, the spirit left, this demon left, but you notice it came back with seven of its buddies, it says, that were more powerful than itself. And I wonder sometimes if that's what's happening in our life. That we go, hey, I know I've got this sin over here, but I'm just going to kind of leave it here. I've got this place of disobedience uh, before Christ that, that I really don't want to change. I'm just going to kind of manage it and focus on some other things. And eventually what we'll see is it begins to grow and build, become more and more powerful and destructive in our life until it's out of control. See, we, we're not called to manage sin what, what Christ has called us to do is to kill sin, to crucify it, to be actively working to eradicate sin from our life. And that's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing because as soon as we eliminate one area of sin, another pops up like the whack-a-mole gain at the, the carnival. But the goal is that we're removing and refining and being more obedient to Jesus. 
And the moment we think that we can just manage the areas of sin and rebellion in our life and not kill them and eradicate them is usually the time it starts building and growing and forming a destructive power in our life that we can't do anything about. So today, let me encourage you to be filling your life with Jesus, to be seeking for him to indwell everything that is within you, to be say, hey, I'm going to repent of sin on a regular basis and, and not just manage it, but eradicate it and fill the void that it leaves with a relationship with Jesus, just spending time with him regularly and really seeking to live a life that is focused on serving Jesus, being on his mission. And I think that you're going to see an amazing result by doing just that. Have a great day, Calvary. We'll see you next time.